the whole story, the whole review is so shocking. I mean, there is you know, one thing to say, thank goodness it's happened. Mm. Thank goodness we've got this report. You know, hooray for Hilary Cass for spending four years. She's clearly produced a really big body of work with a lot of food for thought for the medical profession, for politicians, for activists on both sides. I just hope that... Uh, particularly, this is meant to be about safeguarding children and looking after children, and clearly that hasn't been happening. But I hope that the pendulum doesn't swing so far that now any child that has body dysmorphia is going to be poo-pooed because of uh, because of this report. However, I think what she has produced shows mm. that you know, doctors weren't even allowed; they didn't feel they were allowed to look at those children and think. Why are so many of these children depressed? Why have they got anxiety? Why are so many of them autistic? Could there be a connection here? Because they weren't allowed to, to think that gender dysmorphia might be a mental health condition. Yeah. Therefore, they weren't allowed to join the dots. And that's what David Bell said, was that if you speak out against the ideology, you are then silenced. And this, and I think this is one of the most significant moments in medicine and for society, actually. Mm. I think Hilary Cass has done a great job here. We had the interim report, which came out some months ago. But actually, what she said is essentially what's been happening is ideology trumps clinical evidence. Yeah. We're using puberty blockers on kids when we have no long-term safety data at all. And I remind everyone, our job as clinicians, the first rule is first do no harm. So how do we know what we're doing? And you're right. So when you look back at the numbers, 13 years ago, they were seeing under 50 kids. She said 3,000 there. And my understanding is it's even higher. It's about 5,000 referrals went to those. Now, something, either something significant happened, so that maybe children were feeling more empowered to go and find support, for example, or more referrals were being made. Or, as you rightly say, these are very complex conditions where children go for a number of reasons. Possibly they're being bullied, they have low self-image, they have low self-esteem, or maybe something's happened to them, or abuse, or trauma, or whatever. And suddenly, they're put on that pathway. And what we've heard is that maybe there was one or two clinical consultations, they then start that treatment protocol, and they never come off it. And we also know that some of those kids regretted it. And remember, and there's one other thing that she said that I think is absolutely fascinating and true. The, the young brain is still developing, and as parents of children, you will know, kids are still developing, and actually boys into their late teens, early 20s. Early 20s, And so, absolutely. therefore, how can you make those kind of decisions that impact your life uh, forever? And, and you go through a range of emotions and feelings and sexualities and different identities during your young, you know, adulthood. Many young adults who have transitioned have actually... This is such an important report, isn't it, this mm. cast review? And I think that, um, as David and, and Daisy have both said, I think that it's probably going to be... I hope it's going to be a turning point because we said last week on the talk how many trans kids did we have in our classrooms? And this, you know, huge increase mm. is really, really... Um, I think, symptomatic of something much deeper. Um, but it, what about social contagion? What about the fact that children do things that are fashionable? This is, a, this is talked about a lot, gender dysphoria. Many young people who have transitioned have said they would tell their younger selves to slow down, not to rush into it. And I think that's the approach that adults should have been taking, um, is that this is, you know, having things like top surgery, which is so-called top surgery, which is actually the removal of healthy body parts, healthy genitalia, it's mastectomy for healthy breasts, it's removal of healthy... It's, I think it's absolutely scandalous. I think it's like child abuse. But I think there's a, a range of issues here, which I think you, you touched upon, Daisy, which is about the pendulum swing, because uh, swinging. Because I think, on one hand, we've had ideology and we've had dogma and we've had some who believe that gender if you like, is a, you know, is a, is a choice. Uh, some who believe uh, and don't really understand the difference between biological sex and gender. Uh, and then also a misunderstanding of this and, and applying their ideology, if you like, to something which is a medical situation. And also, you've had those who are very pro talking about puberty, that's the time that you've got to make your decision, that's the time that certain things happen to your body and that's, that's why the intervention takes place then. But I think this report, which I, I'm very pleased to see that all political sides have mm. welcomed it, because I think it, it's, it shines a light on an issue that has been taken over by either those who are very, very pro or those who are very, yeah. very against. 
and we, we as society haven't been able to have a proper conversation because, in fact, the people that we should be most concerned about are the children. Yes. And we've also got to make sure that parents and teachers and other people are given the right amount of involvement depending upon that child's circumstances. So if the child has a really good relationship with parents and teachers, then there's a role. If, for whatever reason, they're feeling very excluded, then there is a role perhaps for other medical practitioners. But I think until or unless... You know, we really work out and have proper conversations instead of being piled on and cancelled and all this sort of business. Whilst we work through trying to work out what the <clears> right answer is, I think, you know, this report hopefully is a good wake up. Um, I've read about 150 pages of the report, if I'm honest. I had to do it for the show earlier. Most of it, it's a great report, mm. but it's mostly common sense. This is not stuff that we're, I'm reading and being like, oh my God, really? Mm. Uh, stuff like, Compared to the general population, young people referred to gender services had higher rates of neglect, physical or emotional abuse, exactly. um, parents who have substance abuse issues, exposure to domestic violence, a loss of a parent through death or abandonment. When we see kids who are underperforming in school, it's not instantly a case of, oh, right, there's something wrong with this. this. This kid needs to change into another gender. It's, well, what's wrong with this kid? Why is he underperforming in school? What is this child doing wrong? How, what, what are the parents like? But you were, two months ago, you could not have said, if this kid wants to be trans, then that's probably a mental health issue because you'd be slammed by everyone. Mm. And unfortunately, the ideology has taken over everything. And that's yeah. what she says and in that, the report. That's obviously. exactly what she said. I mean, it's not that they would be slammed, slammed. It's that you literally medically weren't allowed to say that gender dysmorphia was a mental health issue because that would make you saying that there was something wrong with this kid rather than saying it's a medical and condition. And that's what she says. Yeah. She says there is no other area of medicine that is so, and she uses this word appropriately, I think, toxic.